when you stay in a situation, any relationship that is not healthy for you, then you are dishonoring yourself because you're not doing what's actually best for yourself. When you know something is painful, when you know something is wrong and you ignore it, you are as big of the problem as the other person is. I'm Lisa Billiou, and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize that you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. Did you know that your success is not predicated on your IQ, but rather the zip code you grew up in? Think about that for a second, guys. Your success is more tied to the happenstance of where you were born than how smart, intelligent, or talented you are. So for all intents and purposes, today's Women of Impact was not meant to succeed. Growing up in one of the most dangerous cities in America and losing her father to gun violence at the age of three, she had the perfect excuse to be the victim, to be bitter, to be lost, to not do anything with her life. I mean, who would blame her? And that's the thing about excuses, guys. Most of the time, they're actually valid. But she didn't succumb to them. She made the decision she chose to fight. When faced with a challenge, she chose to boot up and strap on like Laura Croft. When she hit a brick wall, she chose to grab a sledgehammer and swing like Babe Ruth. And if that didn't work, she would borrow Miley's wrecking ball and disintegrate that obstacle. And that fight paid off. Using art as an outlet, she very early on found solace in expressing her feelings through acting, allowing her to get out emotions she was unable to vocalize at such a young age. And that consistent hard work and cultivation of her craft finally led to her big break in the hot show, The Shy. Yep, she had defied all odds and it was a dream come true. Countdown had begun and her career was about to take off into the stratosphere. Until she up and left. You see, after encountering unfortunate inappropriate misconduct with her co-star, she took up the issue with HR, but with no prevail. So she was forced to take a hard look at herself and ask what was she willing to sacrifice for her dreams? Her values? Her integrity? Her dignity? Oh, hell to the no! Regardless of all the naysayers declaring she would never get a role of that magnitude again, she decided, just like she did in childhood, to not stop at a roadblock, to not be the victim, to not let her circumstances dictate her outcome. So she broke her silence, rolled the dice, and bet on herself. And she took the house, landing a role on the Amazon hit drama series, Hunters, alongside Al Pacino, co-starring opposite Reese Witherspoon and Kerry Washington in the highly anticipated Hulu original, Little Fires Everywhere. And, and as if that wasn't freaking impressive enough, co-starring the upcoming Netflix science fiction film, The Midnight Sky, directed by George Clooney. So guys, please help me in welcoming the woman who has become the voice to the silence. The woman who faced her challenges, didn't succumb to her situation and stood up for what she believed in. Like Andy Dufresne, she may have crawled through a pile of crap, but damn did she come out free the other end. The fixer herself, Tiffany Boone. What, what an introduction. <laughs> Girl, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh my God, your story is incredible. Um, and where I want to start that everything that I read about you, your entire career, where you come from, it all started with a fighter's mindset. Mm. So talk to me about that. How did you cultivate that coming from, you know, the most dangerous place in America, developing that fighter's mindset and then being where you are today? Like, what did that look like? For me, you know, it's my mom. It's she had so many obstacles that she had to overcome to be the best mom in the world, the mother that she was to me, being a young mother, um, having her partner die, you know, very early on, um, and having to raise a child alone and sacrificing so much. Um, taking very little help from anyone. I was always with my mom if she, you know if I wasn't at school She found a way to work and work and work and make sure the lights were always on. I always had food I had everything I wanted and needed um, 
And so I guess just watching her never having an excuse for anything, mm. to me it was like, oh, well, you don't, we don't have excuses. Like you make it happen. Whatever you need to make happen, you make it happen and, and you do what you have to do. And so for me, it never really seemed like a fight. Mm. It just felt like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, you know, going like trying to get scholarships for school and college and working all those jobs. That's what my mom did. She worked two and three jobs. She did what she had to do. But my mother also realized that, I think she realized that mm. the years of code kind of determines your future a little bit. And she wound up moving us to a county where the schooling was a lot better. Oh, and she made that opportunity for me and had to drive for an hour to get anywhere, to get to work and all of that, just to make sure I went to a good school. Mm. So yes, I was surrounded by, you know, I would always be in the city and I would always be with my family. She owned property in the city and there was a lot of time I was there and surrounded by that. Um, but she made sure that I was in a mm. safe neighborhood. She made sure that I had the opportunities that I needed to have. Mm. So again, my mother is the literal best. <laughs> Do you actually think then that's what kept you going because she had sacrificed so much, because you had seen how much she had worked to get you out of the, the happenstance that you were in, did you find like an, almost like a certain responsibility then? Yes, absolutely. And it's not a responsibility she ever put on me. Mm. That's the weird thing. Like, you know, I think for me, seeing how hard she worked and how incredible she was, I put that pressure on myself mm. to be like, I have to live up to, you know, who she is. I have to make her proud because she's sacrificed so much. She's worked so hard. I cannot fail. I have to make her proud and I have to one day take care of her the way she's taking care of me. That's always going to be something for me where I'm like, I'm going to keep going, keep going, keep going until my mother doesn't have to work anymore. That's always going to be on my list. Yeah, because yeah. there's so many people in that situation. I mean, it's, it's scary that it's true that where your, what your zip code really does dictate where your life's going to end up. And that's so scary. Yeah. And so most people born in a, you know, one of the most dangerous places, it's like they're going to succumb to that environment. Yeah. But I find it so incredible that you didn't. Um, getting into acting um, is obviously a career that, you know, I'm sure you hear a lot of no's, a lot of rejections. So what allowed you to keep going when you were auditioning? So, you know, you've come out, you've really, you know, um, cultivated your craft of acting yeah. and then you put yourself out there. So talk to me about rejection in those situations and what allowed you to just keep fighting. I'm going to keep using yeah, the word fighting yeah. girl because when I read your story and everything, you're a fighter. So mm -hmm. what allowed you to keep fighting when you're told no, when you don't get the jobs? Yeah. You know, at the beginning, and you're just going on audition after audition after audition and you're just looking for a yes anywhere. I think I was just kind of an auto drive, just like, okay, there's a no, there's a no, there's a no, there's a no. Mm. But after a few years, that gets really daunting and that can really break down your spirit. You start to think, what's wrong with me? You know, you, I'm like, am I not talented enough? Am I not pretty enough? Did I not work hard enough? All of those things. And that really took a toll on me. Um, and it came to a point where I was having anxiety attacks. Um, I was in therapy and nothing was working. Um, and honestly, you know, I haven't talked much about this publicly, but I ended up on antidepressants and anxiety medication. Um, and it was really, really tough. And around that time, I stopped acting. Wow. For about a year, I stopped acting because I was like, it's not worth my mental health. And I have something going on here and I can't just blame it on acting, by the way, because if I was really well inside, then I wouldn't, it wouldn't affect me in that way, right? There has to be something else going on. Um, and so I had to honor myself and just take a break. And I was very scared to go on medication, but I say to people, like, sometimes it's just an imbalance. There's nothing you can do. And I, especially in the black community and communities of color, the stigma around mental health is outrageous. Mm -hmm. It's like, pray it out. What do you mean? There's God. We made it through slavery. Mm -hmm. You can't get a job, girl? Okay, what's the big deal? Like, that's literally what comes back to you. And so for me to go, okay, I need this. I need this medication. I need to be in therapy. I need to be meditating. I need to focus on myself. I have to put this career to the side. I did all of that. And I started a flower business 
Um, it was mostly really more like a hobby because it was mostly my friends just ordering flowers for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I do the, these flower arrangements. And through that process with the medication, with therapy, with meditation, reading, being still, and doing these flower arrangements and having this creative outlet, I was able to come back and know, find what I really loved about acting. Mm. Because I had so much control over the creative process and I wasn't giving anyone else the power in that. I had the power. And I connected to the part that I loved, which is connecting with people, making them smile, Sometimes I give flower arrangements to people and they cry. And I went, oh, that's what I always loved about acting, the connection. So after doing that for a while, I thought, okay, I'm ready to get back to acting. I'm ready to find that connection again. But when I returned, I wasn't desperate anymore. Hmm. So the yes or the no didn't mean anything to me anymore, right? I was going in a room to make a fan. I was going in a room to make a connection with a person. Um, I was going in the room to share my gift, and I had control. I had the power because I didn't need the yes or the no. I didn't need anything from that person other than for them to be present with me. That's all I needed. Um, and so I think that's how I've now learned to like take the nose and keep on pushing because I don't need it. I walked in the room without the job. I'm not losing anything. All I'm only gaining something, and I feel like. I talk to like a lot of young actors and say the same thing to them, like, stop needing it. Stop being desperate for it. Enjoy it. And whatever comes out of it is great. But the no's, the yeses, whatever it is, what it is. Just take the opportunity and be present in, in the moment and you'll have so much more fun and people will connect. Because when you smell de desperation on someone, you're like, yeah, no, thank you. I'm good. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's nasty. It feels gross. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you feel that someone's fully grounded and in their body and present, you want to be near that person. You want to work with that person. You want to sit with that person. You want to be friends with that person, right? So um, I love that. Um, you said some great things there. So I want to take it step by step because yeah. um, for our, my listeners and watchers, the one thing that I always like to say is like, how did you do it? And it may not be universal for everybody, but there are certain things that you just said that you almost brushed by that was so freaking powerful. <laughs> and I want to go a little deeper so yeah. that we can kind of get to like maybe even just how you did it so that other people can try it. Yeah. So you said that, um, which actually it didn't even dawn on me. So thank you for... Um, opening up my eyes to the fact that I didn't think about the African-American community frowning upon um, taking medication. Yeah. So, wow, um, what made you then still do it and not listen or succumb to the pressures around you? Because especially when it comes to culture, like that's hard to fight against. Yeah, um, it's a couple of things. One, I had tried everything else and I was at the end of my rope, mm -hmm. right? when you're sitting in a car on the side, like you have to pull over on the side of the road because you're bawling, crying, you can barely see. When you're in bed feeling like there's a weight on your chest that you can't get off, right? It's, you have no other options. And yeah. at that point, it's screw what everyone else thinks. Yeah. I have to take care of myself. Um, I was also lucky in that I had a couple of other black women in my life who were on a similar road as me. They were mm -hmm. going through a similar journey with their depression and their anxiety. And I had a really good friend of mine that had started to take medication after years of depression. And she was getting better. And I thought, well, if she can do it, mm -hmm. if she has the bravery to do that, what's my excuse, right? Um, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff in our, in all of our cultures that we can be, um, we can be tied to, and we can be bound to, and we can be slaves to. Um, but it's, I love my culture so much. I love being black. It's it's like one of my favorite things. But in order for us to move forward as a culture, there's things we're gonna have to break wide open. You know, that's why I want to talk about it now because if we don't start talking about it, it's never gonna change, and people are gonna stay sick and so for me i just feel like if we're ever going to heal as a community we have to really examine what's happening there's deep trauma in our bodies 
from centuries of oppression and abuse, right? And whatever we need to do to get past it, we have to do that. I don't care what the stigma is. And so luckily enough, I got on the medication and I've, I'm off of it now. I've been off probably a year and a half or so. It wasn't a lifelong thing for me, um, but for some people it is. And I just think if we openly speak about it, then the sti- that's the only way the stigma is gonna go away. Girl, thank you so much for speaking up because you're 100% you. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, just like you saw somebody else, um, who is black taking medication that allowed to almost give you permission to do it. Yeah. The fact that you're now doing the same for basically the world is freaking admirable. So thank you for speaking up. Um, how did you start to tap into what you needed? Not what other people should think you should do, but so flowers, for instance, what process did you do in order to tap into what does Tiffany need? Yeah, so once I started taking the medication and I started to feel more like myself, um, then it was like, okay, acting's not helping whatever's going on with you, Mm -hmm. right? Even though that's all people knew me as my family, friends, um, I didn't want to seem like a quitter. I didn't want to feel like a failure because it's like, well, it's not going well, so... I'm quitting. And there was an embarrassment with that, right? Mm -hmm. All of this comes with so much embarrassment and shame. Um, But for me, performing was all I'd ever known. I hadn't even given anything else another option. You know, I never even thought about what would my life look like if this isn't what I was doing. And honestly, it was just like, how can I be creative? which is what I'm a really creative person. How can I be creative in a way that doesn't harm me? Mm. That isn't beating down my spirit. That isn't leaving me completely depleted at the end of the day. And I thought, well, I really like flowers. It's something that I could just do by myself. I don't need anyone else. Um, Let's try it and see how it goes. It was really like that simple. Yeah. And it see I think there were a lot of people around me that were like, what do, what do you mean? <laughs> you realize you sound crazy, right? You've been acting, you have jobs, you've made money, you've been on television, yeah. and now you're just gonna say, no, nope, yeah. stop, and I'm gonna make flowers? <laughs> like, okay, Tiffany, you're crazy. Yeah. And it really is just, you have to just take out all the noise from everyone else. You just have to, you have to do what's best for yourself and not trying to impress anybody else and not take on the shame and the embarrassment and the trauma, other people's traumas about their own lives and what they're not dealing with. You have to quiet all of that if you're going to really grow as a person and be happy because at the end of the day, I have to go to sleep with myself. I sit there, I lay there by myself. I don't care if my husband's next to me. I'm closing my eyes. It's me. I have to deal with myself. And so really it's, it gets to a point where I just go, turn them off. Yeah. And that's the only way to do it. Yeah, I love that. It's so powerful. And like nothing matters unless when you close your eyes and you say like, how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself? Yeah. Do you have good thoughts about yourself or do you have negative? Um, and I don't think it's an accident that when you took time to really focus on yourself and then come back to acting, from just the personal love of the art itself versus then looking and searching for approval mm. that you ended up getting what, like one of your biggest roles. So I don't think that's an accident. I think my own success on building Quest Nutrition came out of a desire to help people. Um, and me and my husband have been chasing money for eight years prior to that. Mm. So the, de- the decision to stop chasing money and actually go for what is filling you up ended up being the result of our success. And I think the same absolutely is for you. Um, And so I just wish people could hear that, right? It's like, (laughs) go after what truly makes your heart sing, Mm -hmm. be good to yourself first, and then everything else will come with it. Yeah. Um, So then talk to me about, you get this gig, you must have been elated. So Mm -hmm. this is the role on the show. You must have been elated. Um, And then talk to me about the circumstances that happened um, lead after that and then, we can kind of go a little deeper. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still grateful for the opportunity I had on The Shy. Um, And here's the thing, 
you can be grateful for situations that end up being really painful for you. Mm -hmm. I am very grateful for the entirety of this situation because of how much I've learned um, about myself, mm -hmm. um, how much I've been able to connect with people through that show, honestly. You know, it was the first show I did that was about African-American communities, right? I, I never done a, a show with a black cast, anything. And Chicago is a place that I love. Um, so to connect to those people in that way was such a gift. Um, so I'm so, so grateful for the experience. It was not a place that was great for me. It didn't um, align with who I am. Um, and I, I, you know, I haven't spoke about it a lot and I don't want to go into details about it. Um, I wrote the letter that I did because I felt like there was a lot of chatter and a lot of noise about what happened and other people had spoken their piece and people had written about it or been on social media talking about it. Um, it's my story. I own my story. I get to reclaim that story and tell my experience from my point of view. Um, with that said, I mean, even when you introduced it the, at the beginning um, and saying, you know, after allegations against my, my co-star or whatever, I was very clear in that letter to not talk about a single person mm -hmm. or a single experience because it is the experience in totality. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't one person necessarily. It wasn't one thing. It was um, a culture at that show that did not work for me and experiences and things that happened that did not work for me um, and did not um, align with who I am. How did you come to that conclusion then? Because you've got this dream gig on an incredible show. You just said you f your first role where you're really representing your culture, you feel amazing about it, um, and you never know if you're gonna get another gig again, right? right. So it's like you are absolutely rolling the dice. Um, and I love that you were saying that it, because it didn't align with your beliefs and your integrity, um, was that then the driving force to say, even if I never get a gig again, I need to be true to who I am? And going back to what you'd said earlier, when I'm by myself and I close my eyes. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I did two seasons of the show and um, the issue started when we did the pilot. But I was pushing through for all of those reasons. It's a great show and mm. whatever, all mm. the things, right? But as I said in, in my letter, it came a moment where I was just like, is this who you're gonna be? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna stand by and watch bad behavior? Are you gonna co-sign bad behavior mm -hmm. from multiple people? Are you going to let other people be put in harm's way when you know you can say something? Um, and it's not worth it to me. That job, no job is worth my integrity. And through that whole thing of just, being, holding myself accountable and really thinking about every move that I make um, as, you know, where's my integrity? And every single thing that I do, doing every single thing with integrity and trying to, and I fail all the time like all of us do. And all of us, I truly believe, are at the moment trying to do the best we can with what we have, right? But when you know better, you do better, yeah. <laughs> right? And so, when you're called to stand up for yourself or other people, do you sit down and just watch it happen? Or do you, you know, rise to the occasion? And for me, it was like, okay, um, this is a test of who you are. Yeah. This is a complete test of who you are. At this moment, you decide which kind of person you are. Yeah. And it was scary and all of that. And like you said, it was, an, it was another thing, like after coming back from acting, it's my first job, and then I literally was like, well, never know if I'm gonna work again, but I can sleep with myself. <laughs> I can, you know, I can look myself in the mirror and say, I know who you are, and I like who you are. But after that experience and taking that leap, the blessings that have come from that, um, the experiences that I've had, the people I've been able to talk to, even about my experience, 
people have shared their experiences with me, the work I've been able to do, the places I've been able to go. It's just unbelievable. And that's why I can only be grateful for the experience mm. because I wouldn't be here without that. I wouldn't be here without that. I wouldn't be the person that I am today without that. Um, and so I'm just like so full of gratitude. That's amazing. I mean, first of all, I just want to commend you for even keeping your integrity and not going into detail. Like this isn't a gossip show, so, I, you know, but the fact that you have said publicly and you have said on this show and in your Instagram post that you're not looking to just bash people, say names, um, that would be actually easy for you. Right, and, yes. and no one would actually blame you for doing it. Right, but the fact that you're saying, "I know who I am, and I'm going to stay true to it, even though I know I could probably get a lot more attention if I came out." Right, you would get way more attention. Yeah, um, and I hope everyone takes note of that. Whenever it's easy to do that side jab, just don't don't take it. No, and you know, like what I said in in the letter is, I'm working towards forgiveness. Right and this is in all of my relationships, how forgiveness is, I mean, people say it all the time, but it's really for you. Because yeah. if you keep that inside of you, you're the one that's getting hurt. You know, when I've held on to bitterness, I feel it in my chest. I feel it in my gut. I mean, it makes you physically ill when you hold on to that level of hatred and bitterness. Every time I speak people's name in, a, in, a, Ill, in any way that's negative, I feel bad. Yeah. And at the end of the day, those people have to deal with themselves mm -hmm. and what they did. And they have to go to sleep by themselves and look themselves in the mirror and figure out whatever is going on with them. In a lot of ways, I feel, um, I feel sorry for people who are not living with integrity. Yeah. And instead of just being like, I hate that person, I can't stand that person, you're not even trying to understand at all what's going on with them because that's the trauma in you, whatever that is that you need to figure out going, wow, I wonder what happened to you mm -hmm. to make you make these decisions. Mm -hmm. I wonder what got you here. Because obviously you've been hurt. If you can hurt other people in that way, you've been hurt deeply. And I don't have to sit down and try to figure it out with but, you. That's none of my business. Yeah. But I also, it also releases me from some of the disdain because I can just see, oh, there's a little kid there that's trying to figure some stuff out, right? There's a person who's hurt that just needs to figure it out. Maybe they will or maybe they won't. But that's not my burden. I don't have to hold on to whatever is going on with them. Um, I do think it's important to you know, speak up as I did in that situation to hold people accountable for their actions. Um, that doesn't mean people get off. Right. Right. But I also believe that um, I believe in karma deeply. And I believe that is out of my control. And however it's figured out, it's figured out. And it's not me wishing ill on anyone. And it's literally like, the universe will deal with you, however. Because that's actually a very important distinction, right? Yeah. Is that you're not um, wishing ill on someone, but you know karma will come around. Yeah, exactly. I know the universe will deal with us all, yeah, however yeah. it's going to deal with all of us, right? Yeah. And the only way I can move forward is just being like, here's my truth. Mm -hmm. At the root of it, not all the little details that really don't matter, right. but at the root of it, here's my truth. It was a bad situation. I left, I did what was best for me and what I thought was best for other people. I wish everyone well, I'm moving forward. That's it and that's all. Good luck to everybody. Yeah. And again, it's not easy. Right now I feel cool, but tomorrow right. or later today, yeah. I might go, you know, a little bit and that's okay. But as long as I'm working towards forgiveness, all of us working towards forgiveness, um, then that's the best we can do, I think. Right? I heard you say about that you're working also to um, forgive yourself, yeah. the fact that you dishonored yourself. That was yeah. so powerful. How do you even start to forgive yourself with that? And can you actually explain um, how you feel like you dishonored yourself and then how you're working to forgive that? Yeah, I hate to just put the blame on someone else when it's, a, if it's a relationship, if it's a connection between two people, chances are 
both people had some role in the situation, right? Um, whether you were just complicit in it or whatever it is. So after that happened, I had to really evaluate myself and be like, okay, if I'm gonna move forward, how do I stop this from happening again? Um, what did I do to like make this situation happen in whatever way I did that? And for me, like I said, I knew from the pilot that there were issues mm. and I stayed and I didn't have to do that, right? Mm. I didn't, nobody forced me to stay for that time. Yes, I'm under contract and it's my job, but at the end of the day, you saw I was able to be released for my contract. So I had that, those options all along, right? And so um, I, because I liked to be on the show, I like to, I like to act, here's a job, I'm back in acting, this is the first job, and this is a great opportunity. L that whole list of excuses that I have, being the strong black woman, I can get through it, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Like, I can get through it, nobody can break me down, mm -hmm. I can fight through this, I'm gonna do this, nobody's gonna kick me out of this job, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I had to just realize that like those, that was a story I created, and that's why I stayed. And when you stay in a situation, any relationship that is not healthy for you, then you are dishonoring yourself because you're not doing what's actually best for yourself. When you know something is painful, when you know something is wrong and you ignore it, you are as big of the problem as the other person is. And so I had to be real with myself in that. And it was hard and it's still hard. Um, the process to forgiveness is just, <sighs> honestly, it's a lot of like journaling <laughs> and reading <laughs> and realizing um, why I made those decisions, mm -hmm. why I chose to stay and just being like, dude, you did the best you could. Yeah. Giving yourself grace. Just giving yourself grace. Which is so, it's really hard to do for yourself. It's harder than doing it for anyone else, I find. It really is harder to give yourself grace and forgiveness. Um, but I feel like I'm in a much better place, a much better place with it. I think writing that letter helped as well. Yeah. Um, the way you're handling this whole situation, I really truly believe that is another reason why you're able to have moved on and got such incredible roles, which I definitely want to talk <laughs> about. Um, because when I look at you holding such amazing and beautiful integrity in everything, even the way that you're explaining it now, like you're not looking to bash people, you're just looking to tell your story. And finding your voice I think is such a powerful thing and so many women feel like they don't have a voice. Um, talk to me about how you have found your voice and are still finding your voice and what people at home that feel like they can't speak up and yeah. what things they can do to, to do that as well. Yeah. One, I have to say, I have like such an incredible support system mm. and that helps a lot. Um, I'm surrounded by friends and family and even my professional team that have been so, so supportive of me every step of the way that are like, look, however you want to use your voice, however you want to do it, we're here for you and we stand by you. Um, not everyone has that kind of support system and I understand that and it makes it so much harder. But I left the show in 2018 and I was already working on another project, working on Hunters right away. and the reports came out that I left this, the show um, last year, 2019. Um, I just didn't feel like I needed to say anything for a long time. And, I, and if it had never come out publicly that I left the show, I'm not sure that I would have ever said anything publicly. To me, I stood in my truth the moment I said what I had to say <laughs> and spoke to the people who needed to hear what I needed to say, what I had to say, and when I decided, okay, I would like to be released from my contract. I would like to move forward. That's when I used my voice to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like I, I owed anyone anything, mm -hmm. right? I still didn't feel the need to talk. And part of that is just like, you need time to heal and figure out how you feel about things. And I was processing and still healing and trying to work on forgiveness. All of that was happening. Mm -hmm. But I was also working. 
And honestly, it's that other thing of the noise outside, right? I knew who I was. I knew what I had done. I knew I had stood up for myself and other people. And I knew that I had moved forward and was mm. like working on something that I was really proud of. Mm. Um, and so when I decided to, you know, write the letter, it was just, it just felt like the right time to share my story. And I just felt like there was a responsibility there um, for me to speak up and then to share my story that way through the letter. Um, I'm always looking for a way to give back and I'm always looking for a way to, like I said, connect with people. And um, it felt like the right way to do it. Um, just to be like, hey guys, this is my truth. I know people have been wondering, but whatever you heard, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but this is my story. Mm -hmm. And I get to own that, right? Um, so I would just say for other people who are afraid to speak out, um, surround yourself with good people who believe in you and will support you. Um, know that, like I said, at the end of the day, you have to look in that mirror and do you want to like what you see or not? And a lot of times that means you have to speak up. But you can choose how you tell your story. Right. It needs to be right for you. It has to be right for you. Yeah. And um, I just think people should just listen to their gut. Just listen to that little, that little voice in your head. That, like, there's always something that's telling you. And sometimes it comes out physically, but there's always something that's mm. telling you, hey, you need to change this. You need to speak up. You need to just listen to that. And don't be afraid. I mean, it's scary. It's scary. I was, I was scared when I left. I was scared when I hit post for that letter. Things are scary. I don't want to make people think that it's not scary right. and that, yeah, I've had such a great experience, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's going to be the exact same result for you. Mm. But you have to bet on yourself. And you have to believe in yourself and you have to be true to yourself. Um, so, yeah, just just follow your heart, honestly. I love that. And yeah. um, you said that you were actually you'd already started Hunters before you'd post the letter and everything came back out. Um, when I talk about confidence and I talk about embodying strength, even if you don't feel it, sometimes, you know, there's like the debate or fake it till you make it, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I truly believe that if I just tell myself enough, like, okay, you're badass, Lisa, even if I don't feel it, yeah. eventually I start acting in accordance. And then mm -hmm. once I start acting in accordance, I start to feel it. Um, your character, Roxy, is freaking badass. <laughs> um, how much of that character allowed you to get strength in your real life? You know, I have a really hard time with my confidence a lot of the times. And um, when you get to embody a different character, you do take pieces of them with you, right? And so I do think that and every character I've ever played kind of stays with me. So with Roxy, it definitely is like her confidence and her belief that, you know, if I speak, you should be listening to me. And when I walk into the room, you should be looking at me. And I do think, you know, some of that has stayed with me mm -hmm. a little bit of just um, speaking up and and being confident and I can tap into that you know if if I want to <laughs> I should I should do it more often actually now that you're saying it I feel like I should be like okay I'm scared right now be Roxy yeah because I'm sure people, I mean, this is exactly why I do the show and have such incredible women sitting opposite me because there's going to be that one guest that someone at home right now is listening to and they're going to be like, oh, I'm going to be like Tiffany, mm -hmm. right? And so I think everybody has that. Yeah, I mean, it is a lot of psyching yourself yeah. up, you know, because I, I can be kind of shy, but I've chosen a career where you can't be yeah. very shy. Yeah. How do you psych yourself up then? Here's the thing, like I said, I like to connect with people. Yeah. So like I walk in here today and I'm like, I'm tired. How am I gonna get through this? I have to talk about myself for the next hour. <laughs> uh, and then I meet you, I'm like, oh, she's great. You know, like if I stay focused on you wow. and I'm like connecting mm. with you and mm. being authentic and like really trying to tap into my truth, because like through this whole process, by the way, when we're sitting here, I'm going, okay, maybe I shouldn't be that honest. No. Just go ahead and say it. Like literally those that's going on in my head the whole time. Right. And um, when you just keep I keep thinking to myself, be authentic, be authentic, be authentic, like just be yourself. Right. And in that, if I'm authentically being myself, I am a confident person, mm -hmm. you know, like I, 
I am more powerful than I want to give myself credit for. That's the scary part, right? That like, you're actually perfect. You are a perfect person. You have a perfect spirit, right? You are, you have everything you need to make the day happen. You have everything you need to succeed. We're afraid of that. We're afraid of all of that power that we have in our body. So we shut it off and go, oh, I'll make myself small and I'll keep my voice down and I won't say what I have to say because nobody wants to hear it and I'll take up too much space in the room, right? I feel like all of us have that in varying degrees and I have that a lot. But if I'm being Roxy, right, I think she's a person who owns her power, knows how powerful she is and isn't afraid of it. Um, and that's what, you know, on my best days, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do, right? Stand in my power and just connect with the other powerful person across from me. When you're talking about Roxy, by the way, yeah. even just now, everything changed about you. Yeah. <laughs> even the look you had, you had like a more intense look. Just even talking about her. Yeah. So I love on how, I mean, freaking, let's face it, the mind is so powerful. Yeah. Just by believing you can, just by believing that you're Roxy, immediately your body changed, your face changed, <laughs> everything about you changed. Um, and so like that's such a beautiful, perfect example <laughs> of how that you can coax yourself in your mind to believe you are somebody, even if you're not necessarily feeling it initially. Yeah. So I think of you as an incredibly badass, powerful woman. Now you get a gig on Little Fires Everywhere, which is also two other incredibly powerful women. So Reese Witherspoon and um, Kerry Washington. How do you handle that situation? Were you nervous? Um, talk to me about meeting them for the first time, being on set with just other incredible, powerful women and how you don't feel intimidated, because mm. I worry that I would feel intimidated, for sure. Um, and I think everyone can um, relate to being intimidated at one point in their lives. Obviously, that seems like quite a high scale for me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, talk to me about that. Um, well, I obviously, I mean, Carrie and Reese, who, like, who isn't a fan of those two people, you know? Um, I, but specifically Carrie, because I was playing the young, younger version of mm. her, I have been a fan for so long and being another black actress, like all of us in my generation, we look up to her, you know what I mean? She's one of the icons now. Um, she's legendary status at this point. Um, and so when I got the job, obviously that's a lot of pressure and they weren't just like, you know, cause sometimes you watch shows or movies and it's like the younger version of a character but you don't really necessarily see the mannerisms or feel like a super connection between them other than the through line of the story, right? The actors aren't trying to like mimic each other or anything right. like that. Well, they wanted me to like be very close to what Carrie was doing. And no I, pressure. yeah, no pressure. <laughs> but the way I get past the nerves and that kind of thing is just being prepared. Mm. That's all you can do, right? And if I show up and I'm doing my job and I am prepared, then oh well with the nerves because she's going to respect me as a fellow actor, right? They're going to respect my work. And if I've done the work, there's nothing anybody can say. So I would go to set, watch her, take notes through the whole thing, go home and go through the entire script at night going, I feel like she would move like this here I feel like she would do this here she did this at this moment in this scene today I feel like that's a moment here um, just trying to look for her um, what her intentions were what she how I think she would think as the character um, and I just think because I came on set prepared then they respected me you know they just couldn't have anything else to say other than, well, you've really done the work. Great, let's do it, you know? And Carrie and Reese are the producers on the show, right. which is so inspiring. Because even from the first day I showed up, I see they do it with such grace mm -hmm. and such integrity. They're so, they listen, they're supportive of everybody on the set. They push the other actors to be their best. And so it's inspired me to get into the production, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'd already been interested in it. But after the, watching the two of them create such an amazing piece of work and do it with such grace and employ so many women and women of color, I mean, it, it's a video village full of women. 
That's so beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's not just that it's women, because I, I like to be clear that we can't just be pushing women to run things just for the, just yes. to say it, right? Yes. Just so we can say, well, we have a woman running the show. We have a woman directing this episode just because, just mm -hmm. to fill a quota. Right, right. We need to demand that these people are working with integrity as well. Mm -hmm. We have to demand that these women are supporting other women, that they're supporting the men, that they're being, that we're actually leading from what makes us great as women, right? Like not just falling into this male power structure and just saying, well, I got here and so I have to act like the men have acted. You know, belittling people, dismissing people, you're not, not listening to people, just I'm at, I'm at the top and this is what it is. Everybody follow behind. Mm -hmm. But women who are collaborative and supportive and listen and nurture and all of that stuff, that's how we get really great female leadership that's going to change the business. And that's what those two do. And it was so inspiring. I'm so blessed that I got to work with them. Boom, <laughs> drop the mic, holy, God. that was freaking awesome. And I'm so with you on everything you said, I'm like nodding frantically here. <laughs> if people are listening to this, I'm like, I'm literally nodding frantically. Cause you're so right. It's like, who's the right person for the job? And just like they were leading with example for you, I hope you know you're absolutely leading an example for everybody else that's listening and watching this. And I truly freaking mean that. Um, showing up prepared, overcoming your nerves, like everything you've just spoken about is so freaking powerful. So I just want to thank you for, on behalf of everybody at home watching and listening. <laughs> thank you. Um, where can people find Hunters, Little Fires everywhere, and then your new movie with George Clooney. Oh my God, how freaking awesome is that? I mean, again, I've been so blessed. I'm just pitching myself. Um, yes, Amazon. Can I just stop you for a second yeah. though? You may be blessed, but you also have pushed for it and deserve it Thank because you. you've worked for it. And so I always like to, you know, just say that as well because I don't think it's it's coincidence. Um, I, it's karma, right? It's right. you did the things that you needed to do to be true to yourself, and as a result, you this is what's coming of it. So I don't think it was given to you, and you know, I think you freaking earn it, girl. Thank Sorry. you. And you know what? You're, you're absolutely right. And I do think that especially as women, we have to stand and be like, no, I did the work. Yeah, exactly. I did what I had to do to be, believe me, I believe in blessings and I'm very grateful, but also, yes, I did do the work. And I think it's, it makes me uncomfortable to like say that, but it's true, but we really should stand in our power in that way and say, you know, I showed up, I was prepared and I deserve this. It's true. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> um, but yes, um, Hunters on Amazon Prime, out now, Little Fires everywhere on Hulu, every Wednesday, um, and later this year, The Midnight Sky, directed by and starring George Clooney on Netflix. So that's coming out too. And then you can follow me at Tiff Monet on Instagram and Tiff Boone on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I think. That's about everything. <laughs> we'll put all the links below, guys, for them to check out everything you're doing. Yeah. Oh my God, what a freaking awesome woman, <laughs> right? I mean, just everything she said is so empowering. I love doing this show because I have guests like this who really do rock my world and say things that are just so powerful. And I hope you guys felt that at home too. Go follow her, go check out all the shows and movies that she's doing, it's absolutely amazing. If you're not following me, guys, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button down there. And if this episode brought you value, please, please do talk about it and share about it. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. <laughs>